TechCrunch's hardware editor, Brian Heater. Thanks. All right. This is kind of the, the part of the day where I think the energy really starts flagging for people. Uh -huh. Everybody's eating lunch. You've had your I just drank a rock star, so I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to keep the energy high. Unfortunately, we've got a, uh, I, I think, one of the more, I mean, I'm a little biased, but one of the more fascinating topics of the day today. We're going to be talking about AI. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to start with you, Marco, since you are closest to me. Um, what are the biggest pain points for getting enterprise companies to adopt AI technology? Uh, all right. Well, the, I mean, the biggest pain point is that a lot of companies don't even know where to get started. You know, they want to use this cool AI, machine learning stuff, and they don't even know where to start. They literally like come to you. I heard about this AI thing. A lot of times, hook me up. It does happen a lot, actually. And yeah, because you know, I'm with Salesforce, and so a lot of times I do meet with a lot of large, established companies, and I always say to them, you know, it starts with the question. What is the question that you want artificial intelligence to answer? And if you can start with that, if you have a concrete question in mind, then you can get past that pain point. But a lot of people get hung up there. Absolutely. Great. Um, so let, let's actually let's start on a positive note. Um, what are some good examples that we're seeing right now in the world of enterprise companies doing AI right? Good examples. Uh, for me, I, uh, a very good example of doing uh, of companies with, uh, of a company which is, has done AI right is Capital One. It's one of the more uh, I would say AI first companies. Of course, if you think about uh, you know the AI leaders, you're thinking about the Fang companies, right? And, when, and then there are companies like Samsung and, and uh, Capital One, both of whom have spent a lot of time trying to like focus on AI and also kind of infusing AI into pretty much every part of their customer experience. Um, and so if you look at uh, uh, both these companies, Samsung and uh, Capital One, they've infused it into supply chain when, when it comes to Samsung and uh, into banking in a really good way when it comes to Capital One. You guys have anything to add to that? Um, I think another one that springs to mind is actually another bank, which is American Express. Mm -hmm. I think I think that for good reason, the, the financial services companies were amongst the first. They were doing machine learning before it was cool, at least for fraud detection um, and, and occasionally for high frequency trading were some of the first really commercial applications of machine learning before it, w when it was really still too expensive to be, um, to be much good for most other uses. And so it's maybe not a surprise that the banks are a little bit ahead of, uh, of everybody else other than big tech. So why, why is finance such a great great place to start for AI. Uh, they got a lot of data, yeah, mm -hmm. and that data is often clean. I mean, I think the big obstacle, you know, I, I think Marco's 100% right when he mm. says sort of the big obstacle to getting started with AI is knowing what you want AI for. It's a technology. That's like saying, that's like, well, how should I, like, let me get started with software. So like, it's, where, it's, where should it's, I use software, right? It's like, a it's, solution it's, so, it's in search of right. a problem, as they say. So, so that's yeah. step zero for sure. But once you actually have a problem in mind and, 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 and AI is a good fit to solve it, the first thing you need is a lot of data and data that's in the right format, data that's clean, data that's consistent, um, and data that's reliably, like has a reliable pipeline so that as more data comes in, you can absorb it and consume it. Um, and that's where, frankly, most AI projects start and, uh, and founder right away. <laughs> and so I think that banks kind of have a leg up because they have a ton of data, and in the case of financial transaction data, it's pretty clean data. Yeah. I mean, in the case of banks, when we're talking about these very large and, in most cases, very old institutions, you're, you're finding that, um, you know, in spite of the large bureaucracy there, that they're able to be pretty nimble when it comes to adopting AI? Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, banks have been doing data science, and insurance companies, too, have been doing what we now call data science all along. You know, yes. they used to call them actuaries or they, you know, things like that. But these regressions that they used to run before and stuff like that, that's the foundation of what we now know as machine learning. You know, so we call it all this sexy stuff now, but it's the same thing that they've yeah. been doing all along. In other words, I'm not sure they actually, your question is, have they been faster than everybody else? I don't know if that's true. I think they just started earlier. Yeah. yeah. But, but, I, but I think, but some of them certainly have been fast. Yeah. I think Capital One and American right. Express both deserve the shout outs they got for, for that. Yeah, I, I guess the question is kind of, they've been doing a good job of getting out of their own way when it comes to adopting these technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I assume that uh, you know a very small percentage of people actually in the United States are actually actually work for banks. So, what are some of the the kind of low hanging fruits beyond that that we're seeing out there in which AI is being deployed? Well, if I could take that one further, uh, marketing and marketing operations. You know, if you think about like somebody who's totally not a bank is the Indiana Pacers, you know, the <laughs> basketball team. I mean, they do they do generate a lot of money, but that's and they generate a lot of money and they generate <laughs> yeah. a lot of data. But a lot of their data scientists are focused on the basketball, right? Not so much the marketing operations, but they're you know, they apply, I mean, they, they use one of our products to apply a relatively simple question. If I send you an email, 
Are you going to open it or not? Mm. Because I shouldn't send it to you if you're not going to open it. So the question then was relatively clear. And in marketing, because you use these systems that automate your marketing operations, it tends to gather up a bunch of data in a relatively clean and straightforward way that AI can answer those questions pretty quickly and cleanly. And so marketing is one place where uh, a lot of companies that are not banks often get started with, with AI uh, successfully. I actually think the other one, very close to marketing, is personalization, right? It's almost obvious. If you think of the two biggest AI systems in the world, I think of YouTube and the Facebook news feed, actually. And so when you're thinking about customer experiences, you know, you in instinctively know that if you personalize the customer experience, you will have some sort of an uplift, right? And yeah. that, that more, more likely than not translates to higher revenue. So, and, and companies love growth and revenue. So personalization, I think, is a really key AI um, application. It's interesting. So, so using, essentially using machines to offer the human touch. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm a venture <laughs> capitalist, so we, so we always think of the world in terms of theses. And sometimes something we look at a lot is, when is a market ready to adopt AI? Some of it is about AI, the technology, being ready to solve the problem. Mm. But a lot of it, in fact, we think even more of it is about whether a certain market or buyer is ready to accept the risk of AI and, and the risk of like, you know, not necessarily a, a, a binary guaranteed yes or no answer. Like if, you, if I write an algorithm, it will spit out a yes or a no at the end of the day and it will be right or wrong. AI is a lot more fuzzy. It's a lot more probabilistic. It's going to have a confidence interval. And so um, you have to, we, when, you, when you turn a decision over to an AI and not to a human being or a rule, you have to accept a world where it's now fully automated but it's going to be wrong some of the time. The safest, least risky place to start with that was in a lot of these consumer applications like personalization. Mm -hmm. When Netflix recommends a movie, if they're right, awesome. I watch more movies. Netflix wins. Their customer wins. Um, if they're wrong, you know, oh well, I'm no worse off than if there hadn't been a recommendation. Same with when we built the Facebook news feed. You know, so we thought, right? Like if I get the cat photo before the baby photo, and that's what you wanted, then great. And if it's in the wrong order, well, it's still better than random order. Um, so I'm not doing any harm. That's, that's what we were thinking in 2010. I don't know. The, the world <laughs> may prove that we were wrong about that. Um, You're speaking as somebody who has some experience with Facebook. Yes, yes. My first big project at Facebook in 2010 was adopting machine learning for the newsfeed ranker. So that was a, that was, that was a great uh, introduction to the company and to the world. Um, as we enter enterprise use cases, which are of nature more risky than consumer use cases like that, more is at stake. Sales and marketing are a natural place to start because there's all this upside if I make your marketing programs more effective, but not too much downside. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot risk. of downside for banks. There's a lot of risks for banks, right? Um, there's a risk in approving loans, but if you're just still looking for fraud, mm -hmm. if I find more fraud, great. Like if I'm creating a lot of spurious alerts for and. Yeah. and then, then that's not so awesome. But it's not the end of the world if your bank calls you once in a while to say, hey, was this fraud? And it wasn't, right? Yeah. Like as a customer, you feel yeah. protected when that happens. Um, so fraud was a natural first use case. Same with high-frequency trading. I mean, it's similar to marketing. If it works better, it's great upside. Usually they can set it up so that the downside's very capped. Um, and so that's true, I think, of enterprise adoption of AI is that people are prone to experiment first in places where it's sort of a convex, you know, if it works out, it gives me a bunch of upside. But if it doesn't work out, I'm not any worse off than if I didn't try it. Maybe I'm out the time and effort on the project. Um, I think we are now entering the place where AI is more trusted and we're starting to see people being really willing to use AI um, for more significant functions. Yeah. Um, we're seeing m manufacturing start yeah. to use for yield optimization. We're seeing retail start to do merchandising and forecasting. You know, I'm sure Bindu can talk about all the different use cases of her customers. So. And, and then I think there's some really interesting applications out in front of us that are that are pretty high risk and high reward, like human health, climate yeah. change, you know, and 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 uh, and and so those are, you know, it's it's a race, I think, and I think that the te te technology will be ready maybe a little before society is ready to adopt it. Maybe that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I think what Marco was alluding to at the beginning is that all of these, probably every single company right now is kind of champing at the bit to uh, implement it in some way. Um, so it's, it's there, there's no lack of interest, but what are some examples where uh, the technology hasn't really caught up? What are some examples where it's just too risky to, to attempt to implement AI? I'm going to start with something which uh, is very close to my heart, forecasting, right? Uh, it's, I'm, I'm not going to say it's risky. It's more you want to think about it in a... Uh, I would say a thoughtful and a smart manner. A lot of people, especially a lot of manufacturing companies and a lot of like retail companies, love forecasting because you want to be able to plan ahead. You want to be able to forecast exactly how much 
of what item you want to stock in what fulfillment center. You want to be able to figure out exactly how much raw material you need. And it usually, the promise of forecasting things right is you're, you, know, you know exactly how your business is going to go. Who doesn't want to forecast, right? But in a lot of companies come, in, come to us and talk to us about, hey, I want forecasting and I want it to be 100% accurate. <laughs> you know? And that's not going to happen. Yeah. And error bars of even 30 or 40% are very, very common. So how you implement the AI and how, thought, and, and, and how you like, actually work it into your process is going to be really important. Yeah. So I would say that's something which, while people are really stomping at the bit to like, you know, kind of go and implement, um, you want to think, think, think twice about, how effective your forecasting algorithms are and how much data you've got. Yeah, I know, and I think key to that is, and one of the things that I know that Bindu, your company is working on, we're working on it with Einstein as well, is telling you why. You know, when we make a recommendation, when, when, when we're making a prediction, in many cases we have to tell you why is it making that recommendation and the, that need for the why mm. is proportional to the weight of the decision. You know, if it's like, if it's like fraud, like, why is, your, why is your bank calling you about your card? Eh, it doesn't matter, right? You know, if it was a legitimate charge. Who cares, right? Versus like, why are you making this medical diagnosis? Yep. That's on the far end. <laughs> We're not doing that with Einstein, by the way. But in any case, you know, that's a, that's a very heavy decision. Or like judicial bail setting decisions, also not something Einstein is doing, by the way. <laughs> uh, but those are very weighty decisions. And that AI system had better tell you exactly why it's arriving at that recommendation. So again, getting back to this idea that this is clearly something that everybody wants. I mean, it, it's obviously legitimate technology, but it, it is very much a buzzword. Um, I, I think this is actually a question specifically for, for Jocelyn. Uh, what, are you, what are you looking for in an AI startup, and, and how do you weed out the fakes? How do you weed out the, you know, the, the nonsense? Mm. Well, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Fakes and nonsense. I, I, I mean, I, you, you know, there's, there's some of that in any business. Sure. I think you, you just. You don't think it. that's especially the case with AI right now? No. Well, I think what there is is right now there's so much interest and demand in, for AI, um, especially from investors, that I think it, it creates an almost overwhelming imperative for every startup to try to find a way to position themselves as being AI relevant. And what a lot of startups try to do is just say, well, you know, here we have this great software and it solves this great problem for customers and AI, AI. Well, we're going to be, we're going to collect this really interesting data and we'll be able to do some AI with it down the line. And, um, and you know, lots of them may, write, may be right. That may prove to be true. But but AI is probably. But if 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 AI is somewhere out there in their roadmap, then probably um, AI is not central to the value proposition they offer customers. So that's a big filtering function for me, just because m for my firm, you know, I'm not just there to invest in any old startup. I'm there to invest only in AI for startups. So th so that's a filter I can apply. It can be a good company, but if it's not if AI is not central to what they do, then I'm I'm not the right fit as an investor. I would say the other thing that is a little bit um, clear is is you know, when a startup talks to, when you ask them what the AI is going to, sometimes you're talking to somebody pre-product and they're telling you about what they will build or, or what they will do with their data. Mm -hmm. When they start describing to you something that a human could do if they had information like that, and it sounds more like a management consultant than it does like a machine, yeah. um, then I also know that I'm probably not dealing with somebody who, um, who, who knows how to build what they're, what they're describing. Because, you know, I, I wish our industry had landed on a different term than AI. <laughs> it makes us all think of science fiction, you know, open the pod bay door, yeah. pal, mm -hmm. and of sentience. And that's not what this technology is. I like the term machine learning much better. I mean, it's really statistical analysis. The, the, the machine doesn't understand in any meaningful sense of the word. Um, and so I think that that's actually like a pretty common tell of, of mm -hmm. founders who are trying to be AI-ish without without being someone like Bindu, who actually really is an expert. <laughs> you, you don't want people thinking of HAL 3000 when they're, they're doing their <laughs> bankrolls. Or Terminator, no. yeah. No, right? Uh, Bindu, so uh, same question, but to kind of flip the scripts. I mean, you've, you were on the other side of that table. You've, right. You are constantly talking to, to VCs about your, your company. Um, I, I guess this is a very broad question, but you know, how First do part you- part of her job. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how do you convince them that, it, that what you're doing is viable? So it's a good question because right now, uh, to Jocelyn's point, and I think to your point too, there's a lot of noise in the market. So whatever I say, whatever, right? I go to a VC and I say, hey, we're doing X, Y, and Z. We're working on enterprise AI. They literally tell me there are 100 other companies who are doing the exact yeah. same thing. So how do you convince them? I think uh, there are three aspects to convincing them, right? The first thing I f uh, is technology. You have to have some technology, ideally, which you can actually showcase. So if you're, in a, you're at a stage in a startup where you have technology which is actually 
like outperforming and generating value for customers, if you can prove that, if you can say, here are my two or three customers, and here is my technology which got applied in these use cases, that's fantastic. So that, you know, there is value there. Uh, the second aspect of this is, uh, at least in our case, we are doing some AI research. So actually having AI research and original work, which can be vetted by peers, that's obviously a really good sign. And the third aspect, if you don't have any of these two things, which sometimes you don't because you have to raise seed funding, right, in a lot of cases, um, that's when you're going back to your past and basically saying, hey, here's what I've done as, as a founder or founders, um, and here's why I think um, what I'm going to do in the future is going to be successful. So you're going to have to have some proof points to you know, convince these investors. So I'm going to leave this open for everybody because I suspect I can get some you know, distinctly different answers from each of you, but what are... At this moment in time, what are some key opportunities for startups to get involved in the space? Hmm. I can go first. Uh, <laughs> but my uh, favorite opportunity really is enabling enterprises uh, with AI. Right. If you look again, if you look at the fan companies, I like calling them fan companies because obviously they've had astronomical growth. I mean, it talks to their stock, but they're all AI first companies. Right. And they've adopted deep learning. And if you look at a standard enterprise, um, they're very far from adopting it. So uh, companies which enable these enterprises um, to adopt AI and democratize AI, I think that's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say the real opportunity for a startup is sell the solution, not the technology. You know, don't sell the deep learning or the you know, algorithms or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. What do you actually do? I yeah. mean, are you predicting churn? Are you, you know, putting up a chatbot or some fancy natural language thing? Do that and integrate it to tools that people are already using today, like Salesforce. Don't just be in your own little atomic land over there. You know, that's, that's where the opportunity really is, is to actually sell some artificial intelligence, some machine learning that actually works and does something that somebody can understand. I'm, I'm glad you're going last, Chelsea, because <laughs> I feel like you're best positioned to answer this question. I'm just like, oh my gosh, well, I, you know, I couldn't agree more with both of them. My, my, my venture capital firm literally exists to in invest in startups who are enabling enterprises with AI, and I couldn't agree more with, with with Marco, that that you do that by solving, a, starting with the problem, and you and AI is a means to the 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 end of solving it. Um, you know, maybe I'll go the opposite direction and go really brass tacks and nitty gritty. Something I'm very excited about right now is is the way we can use AI to manage data center infrastructure better, mm -hmm. sometimes called AI ops. Um, but I just think that the the complexity of the of the substrate that underlays all technology that is being served to the world today is um, is is exponentially expanding. It's too hard for human beings to manage. And if we can use AI to better manage the infrastructure itself, then um, then we're then it's a force multiplier for every other thing that we want to do with technology to serve the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, one one final question, real quick. Um, leave it open to any one of you again. Uh, what's the best way to go about hiring AI specialists? <laughs> In 30 well, seconds or less. <laughs> easier said than done. Uh, already know a lot of them and be, be an AI luminary that they want to work with. <laughs> I say, honestly, I will say, uh, I mean, we're Salesforce, so we have a lot of developers already, and we bring a lot of people from elsewhere in the company, and sort of, I mean, a lot of people are really excited to get into this world, and they're really ready to get there. It's getting easier and easier to do, so you don't have to hire a deep learning expert to do deep learning. You know, people can become that, and mm. so hire, hire smart full people. stack engineers, yeah. hire smart people, creative people, yeah. I would agree with the training thing, because it's impossible to get so many experts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll want to train them, hire a couple of experts, and hire smart people whom you can train. That's great, we're out of time, thank you so much. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you.